Okay, so um, there are still a few more people coming in, but it, it's really great to see. We already have about 50 people now um, from Hyderabad, uh, Canada, Austria, Berlin, Pittsburgh, Canada, from everywhere, which is really great. Um, and thank you all so much for, for joining us today. Um, this is a very special day, as you know, the 6th of January, um, the opening of the first Casa dei Bambini in Italy. Uh, and we thought this would be a very fitting day to kick off a new series of Educateurs Sans Frontières talks. Uh, my name is Faye Hendrickson. I'm the head of outreach at AMI. Um, and yes, looking at the opening of the Casa de Mambini on 6th of January, uh, we think it offers a very fitting moment of reflection um, as we look at the legacy of Maria Montessori uh, and the roots of her lifelong work. And what we aim to explore in these ESF talks is the social mission of Montessori, uh, looking at the role of the child in society uh, and to examine Montessori's vision on education and peace. And in 2020, we look back on 150 years since the birth of Maria Montessori. And as you know, Montessori advocated for specific rights for children during her lifetime and that an education that would adequately support children would be the key to a more peaceful world. And Montessori has changed the world for children, and she is widely recognized for her groundbreaking contribution to education, um, but there is less recognition on how her vision and practice expands beyond the classroom um, as an education for life and the link between education and peace. And Montessori started her work with children from poor families in San Lorenzo, Rome, and she drew, in, uh, she drew attention to the interconnectivity of all humans uh, with the potential of each child to contribute to a better world. And I think looking back at 2020, uh, life has been very much uprooted for everybody. Uh, and the pandemic has highlighted inequality globally, um, particularly affecting children uh, who are already marginalized. And taking into account this, this new reality, uh, we want to reflect on the social mission uh, at the foundation of Montessori's work something that we all share as Montessori educators. And today we are starting with an exploration of the historical context, and we will then gradually uh, move on to contemporary innovative applications of Montessori principles and practices in diverse settings in the next ESF talks, uh, which will be held later in 2020. And ultimately, uh, we are exploring the questions around what lessons can we learn from Montessori's legacy and what role can Montessori educators play in addressing today's challenges to contribute to a better future for all children? Uh, and I'm excited to announce our speaker for today, which is Erica Moretti. Uh, Erica Moretti is an assistant professor at the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York. Um, she's originally from Italy and she's a historian with a specific focus on modern Italy and Maria Montessori. Uh, and she has published many articles on Montessori and peace, uh, including in the New York Times. And her book, uh, The Best Weapon for Peace, Maria Montessori, Education and Children's Rights will be launched in the summer of 2021, 2021, sorry. <laughs> uh, and we are very thankful for Erica uh, for her willingness to share her research and to kick off the ESF talks. And thank you all for joining. Um, so Erica will kick off now and there will be room for questions and discussions afterwards. Um, and we look forward to continuing the conversation. Uh, and all, please feel free to uh, have the videos on, but please, we do ask you to mute yourselves to make sure that we can all hear Erica. Um, thank you so much. Uh, thank you everybody for being here today. And I wanted to thank specifically uh, ESF for inviting me here and Faye Hendrickson for being my respondent. I met Faye a few years ago at a Montessori conference in Prague and following her work and that of EFS has allowed me over time to, um, sorry, uh, <laughs> has allowed me over time to see, really see the parallels between the work that I'm doing from a historical perspective and the project that ESF is carrying globally right now. As, I meant, as Faye mentioned, I'm a historian. I've presented extensively in uh, North America and in Europe and there's generally a resistance in seeing Montessori as other than an educator and a pedagogue. So whenever I present in my work, despite the, the fact that I really spent a lot of time trying to contextualize it and you know, present the connections that Montessori had to numerous pacifists and humanitarianists, it's always hard to convince that Montessori was also something else. So I'm, I'm really excited to have 
a knowledgeable audience in front of me and to together unpack this layer historical figure, this very complex woman, who in my opinion was of course an educator and a pedagogue, but was also a pacifist, a humanitarianist, and somebody who was deeply interested in disaster relief efforts. Uh, I started working on Montessori almost 15 years ago. And uh, uh, I worked, uh, uh, in the beginning, I read a book that was really influential to me. Uh, the book proposed a shift in paradigm. Uh, it suggested that Montessori, of course, in addition to being, again, a pedagogue and an educator, was also a feminist. Uh, the book was by two Italian historians, Valeria Paola Babini and Luisa Lama. And uh, the main argument of the book is that Montessori from 1896, the year in which she graduated from the University La Sapienza in Rome from the College of Medicine to 1908, a year in which she uh, presents her work uh, at the uh, uh, Women's National Conference in Rome, she's highly engaged in furthering the rights of women in Italy. And uh, you know, the second part of the argument by these two historians is that uh, this, feminine, this feminist engagement highly uh, shapes the way Montessori's conception of the child is. So the writing of Il Metodo in 1909 is deeply influenced by this first period of time in which Montessori was very much of an activist. Uh, the book, if you're interested, uh, what you can do is to Google the name of one of the authors, Babini, and she has a couple of articles in English where the main thrust of her arguments, of their arguments, is summarized. So you can find a little bit more about Montessori's feminist engagement if you want to read about it. So this shift in paradigm, this way of looking at, Mon at Montessori's life from a different perspective, it's, it's also how I wanted to work on Montessori. But I was interested not as much in pacifism. I was, in, I was interested in, uh, in peace. I was, work, I was interested in her work on peace. So what we all know, uh, what many of you might know is that Montessori wrote a series of lectures that are, co that are collected, that are gathered in the collection, Education and Peace. Education and Peace gathers uh, lectures that range from 1932 to 1939, more or less, right? And those are published, they're available. So there's a phase in which Montessori is uh, engaged in the, and her philosophy uh, of peace, that it's out in the open. But what I thought is that it, it couldn't just be a phase. I thought that that was something that extended through her entire life. So, I mean, I just needed to substantiate this idea that I had and to prove that Montessori was committed to peace and humanitarianism sooner than 1932. And at a certain point, I bumped into a, um, a little known project that Montessori carried on during World War I. Now, if you do research on Montessori, uh, you have to commit to a life of traveling. Of course, the mecca of Montessori's documents is the AMI archives. It's the first place you have to go. The staff is extremely knowledgeable and you'll get a lot of help. But on the other hand, you're dealing with a woman who was extremely famous already, you know, at the beginning, you know, 1913, I would say, she was globally famous, but even before that. So what you have to do is really to look at the coverage on her work, both on national and international level, on local newspapers, on national newspapers. And then, you know, the more you go on with time, when you get to the 1920s and 30s, I mean, her work truly becomes global. I'm thinking about, you know, spending a long and extended period of time doing research in Chennai. I'm seeing a lot of people from Chennai today. So, um, you know, I, the first thing that I bumped into uh, to sort of like to substantiate to, uh, to sort of like my argument was uh, a teeny tiny project that Montessori conducted during World War I. This tiny project was called the White Cross. What Montessori was interested on was uh, in uh, trying to create an organization that would systematize their methodology in war zones. I mean, war zones on both sides of the war. So this was an ambition project, somebody that very few people know about. There are some, some articles that have been published in the past years, but aside from that, Montessori does not write extensively about this topic. Montessori didn't come, out, um, didn't come out with the idea of the White Cross on her own. Uh, a well-to-do New Yorker, Mary Rebecca Cromwell, had started working with children affected by the war and just started utilizing Montessori's pedagogy with these children and was trying to demonstrate that Montessori's pedagogy was a veritable cure for all those ills uh, that were caused by the war. 
So uh, maybe Rebecca Tromwell had moved uh, to Paris in 1902. And over time, she had become interested in the Montessori method. So like many other North Americans, many other foreigners, social workers, educators who were interested in the Montessori method, she over time decided to travel to Rome, got to know Montessori, got to see the application of her methodology. And when she returned to France in 1915, she decided to open uh, five Montessori schools in the uh, cities of Saint-Sulpice and Fontanelle Rose. Those two cities were in the periphery of the city of Paris and they would be hosting children affected by war, specifically uh, uh, refugee children from uh, Belgium and Northern France. And here, is a photo of the schools for Franco-Belgian refugees that are inaugurated by Mary Cromwell in one of the two cities. I'm, I'm sure which one it is. The idea was that um, these children, if exposed to the Montessori method, will gradually overcome the traumas of the war. Um, so the children who were posted were almost 200. They were considered to be orphan. And here uh, the definition of orphan come from a, uh, comes from a couple of articles that Montessori writes in Italian. So they're not orphan of both parents uh, in the way that it works in English, in the English language, but they could have been orphan of one parent. Uh, they would be hosted in this school uh, until they would have overcome the traumas of war. Um, Mary Cromwell in 1916 writes to Maria Montessori, who probably at the time was in Barcelona, where she had recently moved, uh, and Montessori decided in the midst of the war to travel to Paris to gauge the validity of her approach as applied to the specific subsets of children. Now, um, Cromwell is not the only one who's concerned about the faith of the Franco-Belgian refugees. In fact, in the, in, the, in the months that were like following the invasion of, these two, of the territory of Belgium and that of Northern France, I mean, many intellectuals, humanitarianists and social workers became interested in the faith of these children in that the news started talking about the so-called rape of Belgium. So the condition of what these children had witnessed uh, was something that was of concern throughout Europe. So uh, what Cromwell and Montessori were doing was were doing uh, was something that was uh, in conversation probably with numerous people throughout Europe who were concerned with the fate of these children. M Mary Cromwell and Montessori's, and Montessori's project was a 360 degree project and that it not only uh, looked at how having these children overcome the traumas of war, but it also looked at what to do with the women who came with these children, probably some of them being mothers of these children, but they could also be in just women who had tried to escape the invasion of their, their homes. Uh, so those women were engaged in that. They were trained as Montessori teachers and they were put to work and they were asked to work and voluntarily decided to work in the five Montessori schools. So probably what you will see here uh, are, you know, our entire groups of people, of refugee people who were engaged in these projects. And probably these women were also refugee women, uh, somehow associated with these children or not, who were integrated into this uh, uh, project that the two women carried out. So I talked about a 360 degree project in that also wounded soldiers were somehow included in the project. Montessori and Cromwell, but surely this is Montessori since this was already happening in other Montessori schools throughout Italy. Uh, included wounded soldiers uh, uh, or employed wounded, wounded soldiers in a workshop for Montessori materials. And here you have a beautiful, this is a photo taken from a pamphlet. Uh, you can find a pamphlet at the Montessori at AMI archives. It's a pamphlet in which you can see the collaboration of these children with the wounded soldiers who are working at the cre creating Montessori material. Um, I mentioned the fact that Montessori is not new to creating an organization, to creating a school that then is in dialogue with other, you know, with other constituency. I mean, a project like this one had already been initiated in the Milanese organization Humanitaria. Uh, the organization Humanitaria, uh, Montessori had collaborated with them since 1908, and we will talk in a second about how this is relevant to uh, Montessori working in disaster relief. 
uh, Montessori opened one of the first children's houses uh, in Milan, uh, sponsored by the organization Humanitaria. It was a social organization that was engaged in uplifting the disadvantaged. So for example, Humanitaria had a, uh, a very efficient unemployment office. They could offer courses for retraining unemployed people. And when they started opening children's houses in their complex, they also started opening a uh, workshop for the creation of Montessori materials where people were trained to uh, be able to do to have this job. So Montessori probably goes back to uh, Barcelona. One, she has been able to assess that her material was working specifically for uh, curing these children from the, the stress of war, from the traumas that they had just experienced, and, starting, uh, and started looking for funds to systematizing uh, the use of her methodology in war zones. Um, in order to systematize this methodology, she, would wa she wanted to create an organization that she would eventually call the White Cross. Why did she want to call it the White Cross? Well, she wanted to sort of contra was, contrast what, was she, what she was doing with what was available at the time. So what Montessori was concerned with was the uh, psychological wellness of these children, as opposed to, for example, organizations such as the Red Cross that instead was concerned with the physical wounds this time of soldiers. So uh, the Red Cross had been created in the second half of the 19th century. It was an organization that at the turn of the century was uh, thinking about its role in society in that um, at the beginning of the 20th century, the White Cross starts engaging in, uh, uh, in uh, helping civilians uh, uh, for natural disasters. We'll talk in a minute about the uh, 1908 Messina Reggio earthquake, uh, and uh, specifically in this instance, the Red Cross uh, took part in the uh, rescue operation. But over the course of the war, the emphasis of the Red Cross was on the physical wounds of combatants. What Montessori was concerned instead were the psychological wounds of civilians, specifically of women and children, specifically of children. So uh, this is how Montessori distinguishes herself at a time in which uh, uh, the, the mental care of uh, the psychological care of children was really something that was not taken into account. Just to give you an example, we all know the organization Save the Children Fund, right? Um, parallel to uh, the creation or the attempts to create the White Cross by Montessori, we have the work of Eglantine Jeb, who will soon create the Save the Children Fund, which is the organization that we know now as Save the Children. Well, uh, uh, Eglantine Jeb was an experienced humanitarianist and she will become soon, uh, because she's one of the signatories of the uh, Declaration of the Rights of the Child in 1924. She will become uh, like a well-known activist in the field of disaster relief for children. But what she does throughout World War I and in the years uh, following World War I is, uh, is mainly focusing on the physical care of children, providing material relief for children, not psychological. So Montessori was concerned in something that at the time was completely new. Well, Montessori, uh, to continue talking about how engaged she was in a vast network of people concerned with peace, Montessori starts writing to numerous people because she wants to get the funds to be able to inaugurate her organization. And she writes mainly to two people. One is the director of Humanitari, the organization that we, we just discussed, that I just spoke about uh, in Milan, who uh, will not, of course, be able to provide any financial support to Montessori. Humanitaria was, a, was not an organization that could provide such support. But that started working with the Montessori method with the tweaks that were suggested by Montessori uh, for the preparation of this specific category of new Montessori teachers. Uh, in the schools that were, uh, you know, they were, uh, they were organized by Humanitaria, the Montessori schools that were organized by Humanitaria. But Montessori also started writing to uh, somebody who was highly invested in pacifism through World War I, probably one of the few people left at the time, as, you know, proposing peace over the course of the Great War would be considered anti-patriotic by anybody who would be, uh, uh, would be by anti-patriotic for everybody. And that was Pope Benedict XV. Uh, Montessori writes an extent, a, a long list of letters to Pope Benedict XV. And unfortunately, the papacy, the Pope only received one of these letters and he receives it uh, in August of 1918. So the war is about to be over. It's a few months before the end of the war. 
And the papacy is a long tradition of not financing or not sponsoring or even giving approval to projects that are not already up and running. In fact, going back to the parallel with a very famous humanitarianist, the Glantine Jeb, um, actually the papacy supported the work of Eglantine Jeb in favor of the material care, care of the children affected by the war. So when it came to Montessori, who proposed this beautiful project, uh, he, you know, he did have to say no because the project was not already up and running. And, uh, you know, what's interesting, it's also uh, a testimony to Montessori's stubbornness and Montessori's uh, will to create this organization. There's a teeny tiny handwritten note on top of the letter that says that Montessori was not happy that her organization was not being funded by the papacy. So um, this was my first, uh, this was what, you know, pushed me to continue working on Montessori and pacifism. Uh, it was, uh, you know, the first, the, the first, piece of the puzzle that, you know, that allow me to continue with my work. The questions that I started asking myself after that is whether Montessori had engaged in disaster relief efforts and in the care of children affected by catastrophe before that. Now, I mentioned that working on Montessori is not easy because the sources on Montessori are scattered throughout, uh, you know, throughout the globe, I have to say. Um, and one of the things I was interested on when I was writing about the White Cross is that in what way is the Montessori materials uh, helpful for children to overcome trauma? Well, now, first of all, Montessori uh, talks about the method as being a veritable cure for all those ills caused by the war. Those are Montessori words. And there are a couple of article that, articles that Montessori writes uh, in Italian press, one by Mary Cromwell. And uh, I mean, this is the extent to which they describe the efficacy of the methodology with children affected by war, but there's very little else. So what I found in time is that there's a, a North American newspaper that covers the experience of the White Cross. Montessori was traveling extensively to the United States at the time. And, uh, uh, and she was really invested into speaking about this project into speaking about the White Cross uh, in order to find uh, more support, maybe finding support somewhere else. And um, uh, this North American journalist explains really well in this teeny tiny newspaper how the method is suitable. So mainly what Montessori argued at the time is that uh, the children were able to overcome the trauma because of a specific feature of the Montessori material. And the feature is that when a child is engaged with a specific uh, uh, part of the material, he repeats extensively the very same activity. And from that repetition, he or she gains satisfaction. It's a, it's a sheer pleasure that the child finds in repeating it all over again. And this is something that Montessori talks about extensively when, uh, you know, in Il Method and in other more famous writings. So what happens here is that this repetition, it's what suits the child and has him pass from a state of convulsion, the study says, agitation and convulsion to a state of calmness, of peacefulness, of quiet. Now, Montessori was talking about it, uh, you know, she was talking about uh, mental lesion. She argued that these children had experienced a trauma that was so profound that, you know, they experienced what she termed a disease of the generation, something that, something that would have passed on to the succeeding generations. Now, we're talking about a woman who's not aware of the concept of post-traumatic stress disorder, which is something that will be elaborated on in the 1970s. Um, and as somebody who's working on this thing in a fairly isolated, in fairly isolated way, but it really, you know, it's, it's really impressive uh, the way in which she's able to, you know, she's a, she's a trained psychiatrist, the way she's able to see from a, a behavioral assessment what is happening in the minds of these children. So I started being interested in whether Montessori was uh, interested in disaster relief efforts prior to the White Cross project. And, you know, I came across a couple of other, one specific project that Montessori worked on uh, at the, you know, in 1908 and 1910. So, you know, that was not the first time that Montessori was interested in children who were affected by natural or human-made catastrophe, right? In the sense of the word human-made. And here, when we're talking about the Messina Ridge earthquake and natural catastrophe. Montessori had already engaged in disaster relief in two ways. Uh, in, at the end of 1908, uh, a violent earthquake uh, uh, leveled the city of Messina, 
and highly affected the region of uh, Calabria. Um, the earthquake was so impactful that the Italian parliament debated for almost 10 days on whether to level entirely the city of Messina that was completely destroyed. The children who were orphaned by, by the catastrophe were several, and many of them were hosted in a series of Montessori schools that were opened in the, in the months following the disaster by the, by the Associazione Nazionale per gli Interessi del Mezzogiorno that was headed by Leopoldo Franchetti, one of the main patrons of the Montessori method and the person who urged Montessori to write Il Metodo uh, in 1909 and hosted her in his villa in Umbria specifically to give her the time to write her methodology. Montessori also um, welcomes 60 toddlers affected by the disaster uh, two years later in one of the children's houses in Rome, uh, the one in Via Giusti. So what I started doing with my research is that I started connecting the dots and uh, you know, expanding the period of time in which Montessori was engaged in uh, pacifism, in humanitarianism, and in disaster relief efforts. And you know, the timeline kept on expanding. Uh, this is another photo of the children affected by the Messina Vedge earthquake. Uh, as you can see, uh, the Montessori's children's house was uh, 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 taking place. I mean, it was inside a convent. And, uh, and you can see that some of the uh, nuns were trained as Montessori teachers. But so um, just to show you how the timeline, or this is the timeline with which I started, right? So we have uh, uh, Montessori's lectures on peace, and we have also the big milestones in the conversation on uh, the evolution of children's rights. So what I started to do with my work is that I populate a new timeline that this time uh, has the goal of sort of bringing to light the work of Montessori as a pacifist, not just in the 1930s, but something that extends through her entire life. And uh, so I hope that we can continue discussing this new timeline and that we can enrich it with our conversation uh, today. Thank you so much.